The year was 1983. Every Breath You Take by the Police was the number one song. Vanessa Williams was voted the first Black Miss America, and the U.S. Embassy was bombed in Beirut. A federal holiday was named for Martin Luther King Jr. Motorola premiered the first mobile phone, and Sally Ride became the first woman in space. And on November 3rd, in a tiny studio at Black Hawk College in Moline, Illinois, a new television station was born. With the push of a fader bar and some buttons, Channel 24 was airborne. The first program was a chemical people about drug and alcohol abuse. But to get to that first program tonight took almost a decade. The journey to local public television took many years, hundreds of volunteers, and the tireless focus of one man, Robert Fletcher, who would become WQPT's first general manager. His partner in the creation of a local public television station was fellow professor Bob White. The deal was the state would only give the equipment if one person was in charge of the equipment as a director and not a teacher. So it was decided that I would do the educational part and Bob would be the director of television. Bob Fletcher was a uh, unique individual. He had more energy and uh, positivism about doing things than anyone you met. Now you gotta understand, Bob was an ex-Marine and he fought in uh, the Korean War and actually uh, won some medals fighting. And he was a tall, straight guy, and he looked like a Marine, and he acted like a Marine. We're going to get this done, and we're going to do it, and we'll get that going. And uh, this was an interesting uh, aspect of uh, his personality, but people kind of uh, gravitated toward him. And he had a ability to just make people believers, and he could talk you in anything. He talked me into a lot of things, I'll say that. He uh, convinced the board that we should have a public television station for one thing, which wouldn't be an easy thing to do when community colleges didn't do that kind of thing. And we were very unique in that respect to start out and get an actual on-air station. In those early days, volunteers were integral to the station startup. Volunteers were recruited at a Friends of WQPT booth located at South Park Mall. One of those first recruiters was the first president of the Friends of 24, Evelyn Perlmutter. Evelyn was instrumental in helping the fledgling station raise the financial resources needed. She was also a driving force behind volunteer recruitment. And one of those early volunteers, Rick Best, would go on to become general manager at the station. I first became familiar with public broadcasting after spending my first two years of college at Blackhawk College, then went on to Northern Illinois University in DeKalb near Chicago and was able to see WTTW, the public TV station from Chicago. I was seeing programs for the first time in my life that I didn't even know existed. You know, the nature programs, the history programs, the science programs, and, and at the risk of sounding like I'm doing a, a pledge break here, these really were programs that I had not seen anywhere else before in my life because when I was growing up, there were no public TV stations in the Quad Cities area. We didn't even have cable television at that point in time, just the three local commercial channels. So I was thrilled to discover this whole new source of programming that I didn't even know existed prior to that. So after moving back to the Quad Cities and working for a small publishing company for a number of years, I saw that Black Hawk College was in the process of creating a public TV station to serve the greater Quad Cities area. I came across a booth at South Park Mall where they were recruiting for volunteers for this fledgling station, and I jumped at the chance to sign up to work on some of the early pledge drives, the auctions, other fundraising events and things throughout the Quad Cities area. And in that process, I got to know the staff at the station, Got to know Bob Fletcher, who was the founding general manager of the station, who I think helped create this station by virtue of sheer personality. Uh, he was somewhat of a force to be reckoned with and just, just a great all-around person to work for. But it soon became apparent that the station was growing, needed more sources of income, grants, and they needed someone to help manage that process. So they went in search of their first business manager. I jumped at the chance to apply for that job and was hired. 
I had the pleasure of working for different general managers at the station before I became the general manager and had that position for about 15 years and had the pleasure of working alongside a lot of great staff people, uh, some of whom are still there today. We were really fighting the giant in Iowa Public Television back in the mid-1980s and on our cable system at the time, WTTW was there too. We were the first UHF station in the community, so we had to teach people how to receive our signal. That was a real challenge, and we were pretty glad when KLJB come, came on board because that gave us another partner in the UHF band. But over all these years, even though we were a little small station uh, in the midst of the state of Iowa, as well as the Chicago Public Broadcasting System, uh, we survived, and we did that because of diligence and hard work, and I was uh, very proud to be part of that team. I think the thing that I'm most proud of in terms of the many years that we did on-air auction, live programming for about 20 hours a week, was the volunteer force, because auction would not have been possible without the literally hundreds of volunteers who helped us put on this fundraising event. We had volunteers who were out in the community obtaining items to be sold during the auction, we had support from the movers and shakers uh, in the community who gave us some uh, very interesting experiences to auction off dinner parties at their house and things like that. And then, of course, the support we received from our media brethren, uh, people like uh, Jim King and Paula Sands and Jim O'Hara and Bob Gelms and Dan Kennedy, all the people that came on air with us some night after night, people like Eric Maitland, for example, who would come be on WQPT to help us make auction a success. My roots to PBS go way back when I was a young broadcaster. Even before I was on the air, I was working behind the scenes at the uh, PBS affiliate in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I was on the production crew. Uh, I, I actually started uh, to get into the station by way of the phone operators for pledge drives. Uh, that, I have quickly realized, was not where I really wanted to be because I wanted to be working uh, the pledge drives uh, from the production person standpoint. So I uh, volunteered and eventually got hired by the station there. I was doing all the behind the scenes things, running the cameras, floor managing, uh, setting up the sets, uh, blowing up balloons for pledge drives. And that was way back in the middle 80s and uh, since then I've been involved in at least one PBS station in every market that I've worked through my career on the air in front of the camera. I actually called WQPT because when I got into town I saw that there was a little bit of an opportunity there and I was willing to help. I wanted to because it was always a lot of fun and so I called WQPT and I asked one of the uh, uh, directors there if I could help out and they had me come in and, and host a few pledge drives and that became uh, year after year uh, it, it expanded into doing auctions and emceeing some events and it's just been a great great thrill to me to help out. I miss the pledge drives in their old form uh, because it was very active, it was very interactive, it was very spur of the moment, it was live, it was happening, the phones were ringing uh, and you could really tell if you made a good pitch to people hey, it's WQPT, and how great is it that you get a chance to support WQPT? And then the phone started to light up, and that was a great feeling because you knew that, you know, maybe in some way you helped get a few more dollars in the till, but, uh, you know, it was, it was always about and will always be about the, the kind of programming that you were able to help bring to local TV via WQPT. I was working at WVIK and Don Wooten would say, you know, here's something and I'm frankly too busy for it, Swanson, you do it. Uh, and that particular pledge or event or whatever it was, uh, he had to be out of town, so I came over and it's been a, a great ride ever since. Uh, I have some great memories of, of getting giddy there, you know, uh, just because you'd, you'd do it for so long, uh, you'd get a little, a little loopy and that was always fun. You know, sleep deprivation, it's a great form of entertainment. When I came to the Quad Cities, I was enthralled by the Bix, but I was not an athlete. So I decided years after I arrived, arrived in the Quad Cities to become a runner. So I started running, 
and I got very deep into running. And I thought it would be really neat for my kids to start running. Eventually, the first race that I took my youngest daughter to, uh, the Ready to Learn races from WQPT. And she had a blast, and I had a blast because I ran with her around the track for her very first run. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, that day was filled with events and activities, not just for the kids, but for the whole family. And I loved it because it was WQPT, and I knew everybody, I knew what it was all about, and I don't think the kids had a better day. Volunteers continue to be an important asset in everything that WQPT does. They make events like Imagination Station, the Ready to Learn Races, Brouhaha, and the Wall That Heals possible. And the elite volunteer crew, known as the WQPT PBS Ambassadors, specially trained college students, help the station reach farther into surrounding communities at festivals, schools, and events. Over the years, WQPT has produced numerous programs that focus specifically on our community. The late Congressman Lane Evans hosted a public affairs program calling Representative Evans. There was a news magazine, Life and Times, and a talk show, Perspective, both hosted by Susan McPeters. WQPT would produce award-winning documentaries like Chad Pagracki, The River Rescuer, and Letters Home to Hero Street, along with powerful stories like Three Esters. WQPT has documented performances from an early nutcracker to capturing the glorious sounds of the Westbrook singers. Plus, artists like the eclectic Bucktown Review and musical programming like Currents at the Crossroad with Ellis Kell and RME Originals have all found a home on local public television. WQPT keeps voters informed with debates and public affairs programming like The Cities with Jim Mertens, now in its ninth year, we keep our area up to date on what's going on in and around our hometowns. And WQPT continues our educational mission in our classrooms, reading and teaching coding and teaching kids on the air through our own Mr. Scott. Let's go on a safari, an insect safari. I've got my observation container. These and stories and storytellers kind of have and remain WQPT's like mission. Thank heavens for uh, WQPT and the cities and for Jim Mertens and Laura Adams and everybody who puts that show together. There frankly is no longer any place where we can discuss uh, local ideas at some length. People might be tempted to think that just because an idea is a local idea, it's not complicated enough to give it 15 minutes of serious consideration. And that's where public broadcasting steps in. Right? So uh, having an, a program like the cities and other local engagements that WQPT leads the charge on is essential. And woe unto us as a community if we ever become a community like we were in the 1970s that didn't have public broadcasting. Over the years, WQPT has faced a number of challenges. Everything from a reduction in funding and staff to mandated changes in technology. And each challenge has been met with innovation and hard work. Another major challenge that the station faced, as did all TV stations in the 90s, was the uh, transition from analog to digital broadcasting. Fortunately, at that point in time, the state of Illinois was able to give a grant to all public TV stations in the state to help with the purchase of new digital broadcasting equipment, transmission equipment, and we basically had to switch over our entire engineering plant to digital while we stayed on the air at the same time. But we eventually became actually the first station to broadcast in high definition in the Quad Cities area. That process, as you might recall, was also a major challenge for a lot of our viewers out there who had to make that transition from analog TV sets to digital sets or set-top boxes that allowed them to receive the new signal. Um, I made many trips to uh, viewers' homes throughout the Quad Cities area just to assist them with setting up those boxes and figuring out how this new technology worked. One of the more interesting things about working for a small public broadcasting station is that we were able to undertake a lot of projects that larger stations wouldn't dream of doing. We would go to uh, national PBS conferences and we'd be talking with stations about uh, projects we would do, local programming that we would produce. And then when they discovered what the size of our staff was and what the size of our budget was, they were fairly incredulous because they were oftentimes projects that they wouldn't even dream of undertaking. 
but when you have a very small but very dedicated staff, uh, you'd be surprised at what you can accomplish. Uh, we sort of compared ourselves to the little engine that could because we, we just uh, we came up with ideas and we pursued them uh, again with some very dedicated staff members and with the help of a lot of volunteers throughout the community and funding sources throughout the community. Like many public TV stations around the country, WQPT faced some financial challenges of its own. Um, the state of Illinois was not able to provide funding to its educational institutions as it had done in the past, so Blackhawk College was faced with the difficult decision of how to allocate its own budget monies internally. It was decided that over a couple year period that their funding for WQPT would be reduced to zero. So the staff and the board was faced with the task of figuring out how to operate a station on a considerably reduced funding level. The result was some reduction in staff. Uh, we became the first public TV station in the country to strike up a, a public-private partnership with a private broadcasting company to operate our transmission facilities, our master control operation. That, in fact, is a model that has become much more common over the years around the country as many stations have faced financial challenges and um, have in fact combined their master control operations with other stations around the country. It's not unusual for a station, say in Indiana, to have its master control operation in Arizona. Uh, that's possible through digital technology and fiber optic technology, uh, and that saves a lot of money for a lot of stations, and we were one of the first ones to embark upon that model of operations. In addition to zeroing out the budget, the college eventually decided that they were no longer going to be in the business of operating a public broadcasting station, so they challenged uh, me and our board of directors with finding a way to operate independent of Black Hawk College and at a different location. Fortunately, at that time, one of our board members was Joe Reeves, who is the executive vice president of Western Illinois University in the Quad Cities, and he started thinking about whether this TV station might be a good fit for the university. To our good fortune, they decided that it would be a good fit, and WQPT eventually made the transition of its license and ownership from Black Hawk College to Western Illinois University, where it resides today. PBS is a national trademark and so what better way if Western wants to be a leader in quality, opportunity, and affordability that, and education, well, the marriage was obvious. WQPT is a tiny little station in the PBS system and we're very inventive about how we are able to maintain our service to the community and so there's a certain nimbleness that we have because we're small and mighty, and we are able to take these problems in turn and figure out, okay, what's the best solution for what we want to accomplish, keeping that priority always in mind. How can we be the best Quad Cities PBS station that, that we can be? So there are other kinds of infrastructure needs that we turn to colleagues to help us resolve, and we are becoming and have become uh, a model for a lot of how public television stations can operate and maybe even in, in commercial TV as well, is how much uh, infrastructure capital expense do you really need to invest in and maintain in order to have a community station. And so the, the, the collaboration with professionals both within the community and in our system is, is key to WQPT's current success. We did have to create a new infrastructure for the master control piece of the television operation, mostly because the master control that was being used uh, got sold to another company and they moved to Dallas. So the, the infrastructure was changing anyway, and our contract with them was ending. So we turned to the public broadcasting system to help find the answers so that we would have people that understood our mission, understood uh, and have access to our programming, and understand the priorities that a public television station would have in putting programs on the air. And we were very fortunate that our sister station in Peoria, WTVP, was willing to work with us to make that happen. So we established a master control presence at their uh, facility in Peoria and then we had to install fiber to the transmitter so that we would be able to have a signal to the Quad Cities that was uh, 
programmed by WQPT and delivered to the Quad Cities. So there were deadlines attached to that that made some days very interesting, but uh, we were able to get that accomplished uh, within six months of me starting. It was something that needed my immediate attention. One of the things that attracted me to WQPT when I first came here uh, five years ago was the challenges of making a public television station out of the circumstances that WQPT was in. They no longer had a, a building with a studio, the mass control was outsourced, and so how do you create community without a standalone facility? And this was a, a challenge that intrigued me uh, because I truly believe that public television is an expression of the community. It doesn't always rest just on where the technology is housed. So this was an excellent opportunity to kind of evaluate that assertion and see how we could help WQPT uh, grow in importance to the community and solve the technical issues uh, that people don't always see every day in a way that would continue to be, have a strong delivery presence for the community and, uh, and help the station uh, manage its costs well. WQPT is not only a channel on the dial, it's a community resource. Reaching out into our schools and libraries, providing resources and encouraging lifelong learning. Wow, that's what I hear from people, it's wow. Um, the station really took on embracing our military and what a military friendly community we are. The community loves Imagination Station. It's a little terrifying to see 4,000 little people running across campus, but I'm getting there. Just the way you've reached out and made it your PBS station, and I know that sounds a little bit cliche, but it's truly what I feel in this community. And I get all these people thanking me for bringing WQPT to Western, well, the thanks goes to the board who trusted us, the thanks goes to the staff who said, I want to make this happen, and the thanks go to the thousands of people who volunteer, the thousands of people who donate, the thousands of people who send their friends. I just want to write on the success of it. At the end of the day, America is an idea. That's really what it is. And you have a different interpretation of that idea than I do, and that's good. But for one that I think will work for today, I'll say it's ex pluribus unum, out of many, one, right? So that idea works best when we take my interpretation and your interpretation and let them bump up against each other and maybe even skin each other's knees, right? Because out of it comes a stronger idea. I often think that if every American could come together around a big bowl of buttery popcorn and watch Ken Burns' The Civil War, uh, we'd be a better society. Or uh, if we, The War, I mean the later one. Uh, so some of the documentaries that became common moments in, in, for Americans were very meaningful to me personally as well. Because if it's just too easy in today's society for me to take my idea and go over here and let you have your idea and go over there. But there were these moments uh, facilitated and moderated by WQPT and public broadcasting that would bring us together. So documentaries, they help me understand what it means to be an American. We are a small station, so we operate within the confines of that capacity. Uh, but we are uh, looking at improving our signal. In order to be a broadcast station, you have to be broadcasting. So, and probably about 40% of our, our uh, households in the Quad Cities get us over the air, and increasingly so. There's a lot of people who prefer to get us over the air than through cable or satellite anymore. So we are working to improve our signal. We want to raise the antenna higher on the tower. We want to put in a little bit more powerful transmitter so that our households within the Quad Cities, all the families that we serve even within the Quad Cities, can get a better signal from WQPT. I was trying to think of a festival in downtown Moline. I think, it was, I think they had it more than one year called a taste of the Quad Cities or a taste of Moline or something. We were in front of the mark and we had the usual tent set up and Steve was there with me. We were 
manning the tent. We had a huge helium tank that nobody could lift, except two of us to, to get it in my van. We had bouncy balloons we were handing out. We were doing and had a banner and we were meeting and greeting and program guides. And because I had the van that was totally empty, I got to take everything home at midnight or 1 a.m. and happened to be driving to where I lived near the station at Blackhawk in those days. I encountered at Riverside Park what they call a safety check in your car. The nice officer comes to the window, very polite, very professional, roll down the window, checks the license, have me do my blinkers, walks around. So I had Clifford riding next to me. And after they had given me back my license, he got a slight smile. And he had a little flashlight. He shined his flashlight on Clifford, and he said something to the effect, I know you would only ride with a safe and sober driver, Clifford. And then he looks at me with another generous smile, and he said, Clifford needs his sleep. You need to get him home. And I, I thought about that for some time. Maybe this young man, the officer, was a father. Maybe he had seen it. I don't know. But it connected Clifford with WQPT programming, which we always said on air, children is safe. It's something that parents can trust on. Clifford is a decent dog. He, he's rational, as most of the characters are on, on public television and WQPT. They're quiet. They're gentle. Uh, think of Mr. Rogers, the epitome of that. In that brief moment, there was a connection of community between me, the officer, and a stuffed dog that said to me, life is good when people work together. And I think public television tries to promote that in their programming of, of places you could never travel to. Uh, they care for animals, the environmental stuff. It all comes together and you only find it on WQPT and public television stations. I think that WQPT's future with the community is only defined by what, what the community's vision is. So how does WQPT help to create the kinds of communication vehicles, the kinds of insight, the kinds of reports that the community wants to see in order for the, the Quad Cities to grow and, uh, and succeed and thrive. Uh, we are the Quad Cities Station, and we understand this bi-state kind of, you know, four or five different cities and the surrounding areas and, and the culture of this region um, better than, than most. So we have our ears wide open and our eyes wide open, and we take time to listen to what the community's priorities are and hope to continue to meet those in years to come. I do remember that I used to sit and talk to Bob, and we, when we would sit and talk, Bob and I sometimes, uh, over an adult beverage or something, we would uh, <laughs> say, uh, can you believe that here's two high school teachers and uh, here we are running a public television station? But we used to be amazed at how we'd come and so we'd say, well, where is this going to go? And Bob says, wherever it leads us, we'll take it there. The Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. This act has a host of fathers. And while we work every day to produce new goods and to create new wealth, we want, most of all, to enrich man's spirit. And that is the purpose of this act. It will give a wider and, I think, stronger voice to educational radio and television. And most important, it builds a new institution, the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. This corporation will assist stations and producers who aim for the best in broadcasting good music, in broadcasting exciting plays, in broadcasting reports on the whole fascinating range of human activity. It will try to prove that what educates can also be exciting. So today, we rededicate a part of the airwaves which belong to all the people, and we dedicate them for the enlightenment of all the people.